All right, welcome back to the program. Nine minutes after one o'clock now on a Friday afternoon, uh, TGIF. Get your snow galoshes ready. I don't know if people wear galoshes anymore. We used to wear galoshes when we were kids. I don't know. Do you wear a, galo- a, a, a galoshes over there? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mike is Mike. Mike is our IT guy. Uh, he wears galoshes. I, I haven't had galoshes since I was a little kid. When they used to make us wear those paper hats and everything else to go to elementary school, but. It's going to be in and out. It's going to be quick. Uh, the ABC6 Weather Center forecast, of course, we're watching that for you, and that'll be with us uh, throughout the day today and throughout the weekend as you uh, need to uh, follow the storm. But right now, it looks like about three to six inches, according to uh, Chelsea Priest. All right, we are um, talking uh, with, uh, we're going to be talking in just a second with the um, Speaker Pro Tem of the Massachusetts House, State Representative Patricia Haddad of Somerset, and a lot of things to be talking about with her, and not the least of which is uh, what's been happening, of course, over the last couple of days uh, in Florida, uh, how it relates to Massachusetts. Uh, Representative Haddad, Madam Speaker, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Oh, always a pleasure, Barry. And how's the volume? Because I'm on my speakerphone. I, I, I can hear you okay. If it gets to be a problem, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Sounds sounds good so far. Um, So you're on your way uh, somewhere. We're talking a lot here today about school security, Madam Speaker. And uh, we've, Mm -hmm. um, as you know, uh, in Fall River, uh, there was a um, a non credible uh, threat against uh, Durfee. Uh, We've had the same here in New Bedford. Dartmouth has had the same thing today, uh, following the uh, uh, what's happened in Florida this week. And a lot of folks are asking today, how do we make our schools? safer. It's not enough to just talk about, uh, you know, gun control. Um, our schools have become battlegrounds and, and kids without security, teachers without security. You're a former teacher. You understand this. Um, how, do we make this how do we make the school safer? What can we do? You know, we've been talking, I think it's been 20 years we've been talking about this because I remember all the way back to Columbine. And uh, I was on the school committee in Somerset then and we started locking doors, and um, there were all these security precautions to get in. And everybody was very worried, and, you know, we don't want our kids uh, feeling like they're living in a prison. But, I, you know, if I don't know that we can make the schools any safer. But what we really have to do, I really believe we have to do, is change um, the way we treat people. I think we've in the last, I don't know, however many shootings, these people have had um, serious issues from from mental illness to being bullied. I'm, I won't be surprised if we find this young person had um, a, a bad experience in school. So I think it's more than the schools, and I know some of my colleagues who are very anti-gun will not like to hear me say this, but I think we have some some very credible, strong laws in Massachusetts, but now we have to change the tone of everything. And, and you know, we've done things with bullying, and, you know, we've tried very hard around mental illness, but we've got to try harder. We've got to work harder at this. Well, we certainly know that this uh, this young man had a, a a background. Now, we were just reading this morning, 35 visits to his house um, for violent issues, including fighting with his mother, stepmother, fighting with his brother. Uh, police were there, saw him cutting his arm with a, with a razor blade. Um, so mm-hmm. various things. Never once was this kid charged. And now we're finding right. out the FBI just uh, just confirmed that back on January 5th, of this year, about 40 days ago, they found out uh, that he was armed with a gun and was actually talking about killing people and um, was considered by them to be a potential school shooter. And yet nothing's done. I mean, he th- this kid was able to walk in um, unabetted into a school and, and open fire on people. Right. So I don't know what the laws are in Florida, but obviously they've got an issue. They've got a problem that they need to address. And you're right. What about the FBI? I mean, geez, if they had all this information, shame on them that they didn't act on it immediately. Yeah. We're looking at a situation, though, Representative Haddad, that um, uh, if we have tough, tough gun control, which we we do, 
Uh, but if we were to even to take all of the guns off of the planet, we've got a situation whereby people would attack the schools, maybe using car bombs or grenades or whatever. So, I mean, there's always going to be a risk. The schools, the way I view it right now, I mean, the kids and the teachers, we've, we've heard the heroics of the teachers uh, covering students with their bodies and, and um, protecting their students and dying in the process. Teachers shouldn't be dying. Kids shouldn't be hiding in closets waiting for you know police to get there. So, I mean, are we, we know that this mentality exists in our country right now where people want to cause harm to the schools. Why not fortify our schools, spend the money and provide the security, whether it be armed guards, or whatever we need to have there in order to make sure these schools are safe. And and I don't disagree. The question I'm sure that will come up is who pays for this? Does it come out of a school budget? Um, you know, and, and I would say no because the school budget is supposed to be for educating kids, but what can we do with our public safety? And I think it would be great if here in Massachusetts we put some local police officials and schools in a room and said let's really pound this out let's not leave until we have a really realistic plan for how to deal with this because kids you're right kids shouldn't go to school scared and teachers should not have to give their lives for their students yeah, as a teacher, could you, now you left uh, teaching before any of this madness began. Could you ever in your, your wildest dreams have imagined anything like this? Never, 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 never. I mean, we had, you know, the school that I taught at, every door was open. Uh, we never worried. You never worried about a parent coming to visit. You never worried about bringing in a, a presentation or anything and now you know we're querying people just to go on a school trip we're querying people who come into a school to try to get at some of this but um, it's so much bigger than that and it's so sad that we actually have to think and say the word fortify and school in the same step the second no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, that's the uh, uh, that's the, the, the horrible part about this. I mean, tw 20 years ago, we didn't have to worry about this. Today, it is a situation. So there's, there's no place that you can see in the budget where we can provide any kind of uh, local uh, communities with uh, with security money to help beef up security. I know here in New Bedford, they're going to take up next week at the city council um, uh, a plan maybe to uh, try to get some money to install uh, uh, panic buttons or, or additional security cameras or whatever. But camera is only good if you've got somebody monitoring them, right? Right, right. But I mean, you know, is it that we have to have metal detectors? That would, you know, just uh, even the visual of everybody having to go through a metal detector to get into a school oh god it, it just turns my stomach mm. but i mean think about it before 9 11 at the state house there were probably 14 doors and now you have to go in two doors only and they have metal detectors so is that what we're coming to um, i hate to think about it but i think it has to be put on the table is this um is this the next step right all right, um, Madam Speaker, I want to talk to you about a couple of other things, too. Uh, issues that are um, um, uh, important to uh, the greater New Bedford area than some things on the state. Um, the mayor of New Bedford, uh, John Mitchell, who I know you know, um, is begging the state transportation uh, uh, department for some money for a new bridge. We've got the uh, the New Bedford Fairhaven Bridge, which I'm sure you've been over a couple of times. Uh, a few times. A few yeah. times. Over 100 years old, breaks down. You can't even get parts for it anymore. And uh, transportation yep. is saying, you know what, we just uh, we just don't have any money to help you out. Um, this is an important bridge for the local economy. Is there any hope of finding a way to uh, get some money in the budget for that? Well, I think we're all right now looking towards um, the federal government and the infrastructure uh, proposal that's out there and hoping that we can somehow combine whatever what we have in uh, as far as state money with the, some federal money um, that will be coming in. And even if we can't get it specifically for that bridge, if we can uh, move some projects onto federal dollar, then it frees up state money for the, uh, you know, for a local, a more local project. So it is, there's a lot of instances like that. I mean, look how long it took us to replace the uh, Brightman Street Bridge, which was also over 100 years old before we finally closed it down. We have infrastructure problems. There's no, there's no doubt about it. 
And no one, you know, talk about having the crystal ball, no one could have foreseen the number of cars and the number of trucks and the kinds of traffic that we would be asking to go over these roads and bridges built you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago. Yeah. So you think the solution to this is a combination between state and federal funding, perhaps part of the national infrastructure uh, uh, legislation that's being drafted, right? Yes, I I absolutely think there's going to have to be some partnerships. I mean, the the state has to have some skin in the game, and we've got to leverage um, the federal dollars to make these these, uh, projects happen. So let's talk about South Coast Rail, something you and I have never spoken about, right? In all the years that I've known, you've never spoken about South Coast Rail, right? But um, it, <laughs> it looks as though at this point uh, we're going to get a South Coast Rail. It's not going to be the one that everybody um, had been lobbying for. This one would go through uh, Middleborough. Um, I know uh-huh. the New Bedford delegation's not thrilled. The Taunton delegation's not thrilled. Uh, Middleborough doesn't like it. Lakeville doesn't like it. But I, I hear the Fall River delegation thinks this is pretty good. Am I, am I correct? Well, here's the thing. Um, I guess it's, in my opinion, getting something is better than waiting however many more years. And it doesn't mean that we're not still, or, and that the administration is not still looking at the Stoughton route. It means that there will be a light for some people uh, to get on a train to get up to the Boston area and vice versa for people to come down to the Boston area. And I think that's, that's the important part to us, not to close the door on something immediate, holding out for something that we don't have a good handle on when it's going to happen or how much it's going to cost. Madam Speaker, can you say here unequivocally that you still believe the Stoughton route is a possibility? Well, you know, I don't ever want to say no, because my feeling is that uh, some of this is trying to wear people down. And and if we don't continue to advocate and we don't continue to go forward in whatever small incremental steps we can go forward, then we might as well forget about it. And I'm not willing to do that. But, I, you know, you're right. I can't say unequivocally that it's going to happen, but I'm certainly not going to um, walk away from it and, and assume, you know, I don't want to assume that this is all we can have. I want to assume that this is the beginning of what we can have. Well, I'm looking here at, uh, I know I know Senator Pacheco is, is not real thrilled in Taunton because I guess no. the Middleborough route is going to bypass Taunton altogether. Uh, the folks in Middleborough are saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, don't we have a say in this? Lakeville saying this is going to bring all kinds of traffic to us. John Mitchell here in New Bedford is saying um, this is going to uh, take uh, an hour and a half to get to Boston, and who's going to want to do that to commute? That's a three-hour commute. Uh, there and back each day. Um, so it just seems to me if, we're, if we can't get the Stoughton thing, why spend $935 million on something that nobody really wants? We could replace the bridge with that and give you guys, uh, you know, some money in Fall River to finish Route 79 or whatever. You know, I mean, it just seems to me that we could take that money and put it to things that everybody would be happy with. So, Barry, my commute in the morning is an hour and a half by car. And if I'm driving... I, you know, I may do some calling on um, my Bluetooth, but I can't do email. I can't text. I can't do any of the uh, reading that I always do every day. So I think that there are people who feel that it would be an hour and a half better spent. And yes, it's not ideal, but it certainly is better than sitting in traffic and, um, you know, <laughs> I can't even tell you how much I grumble in traffic and, you know, watch people on the sides of me doing things they shouldn't be doing and getting frustrated. And, um, you know, I think, I think some people want to get out from behind their wheel and into a comfortable place where they can have some productive time. 
We have with us for another few moments uh, the Speaker Pro Tem of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, uh, uh, Patricia Haddad, State Representative from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Somerset. And yesterday, you guys, I guess, approved a supplemental budget and sent it off to the governor and includes some money uh, to help communities like New Bedford and Fall River. I'm not sure if Fall, to, to what degree Fall River um, has a need, but I know in New Bedford we have a terrific need for uh, money to help um, um, offset the cost of uh, students from Puerto Rico that have come here and resettled yeah. as a result of the uh, uh, the big storm down there. I know the mayor uh, here had asked uh, uh, for some help up on uh, Beacon Hill. So um, what's this uh, about? Is there enough, uh, do you think, that's going to be able to help local communities that, that are being impacted by this? Well, it's $15 million, and um, that should uh, cover what, what we know is the population right now. We're putting... Um, the chairman of Ways and Means is putting in money into the upcoming uh, FY19 budget specifically for that population. So uh, we will know with the, the October 1st census if there are more students that we need to cover. But we've, we've pledged to cover that because we know that it's, um, it's very generous of communities to do this. And um, they're Americans. You know, they happen to speak another language, but they're Americans and we need to take care of them. And we're, we're very grateful to the cities, mostly cities, who took in people from Puerto Rico. Now, is the legislature also considering some kind of housing aid? Because I know here in New Bedford, what's happened is that uh, uh, many of these folks are staying um, in public housing that has rules about um, how long you, you're allowed to stay there. And uh, right. I, many of these folks have gone beyond those rules. And, and there really isn't a whole lot of housing in the city. Um, so I know the mayor is saying that that's become an issue here, too. Is, is there any housing funds do you think that might be available to? So we actually did a housing bond bill just recently, the House did, and I'm not, forgive me for not knowing whether the Senate has taken it up. But yes, there is money for um, uh, building and repairing of public housing, as well as uh, trying to some market rate housing and low income housing. We're very short on, on uh affordable housing. So yes, we do have a bond bill that it is, is going forward and should be helpful um, to the cities and towns. And finally, I wanted to ask you about the uh, Cannabis Control Commission. I guess uh, everybody uh, up, up on Beacon Hill right now is pretty much saying, hey, let's, you know, let's slow down. Let's put the brakes on uh, rolling out uh, what exactly we're going to do uh, with, the, with the marijuana uh, in terms of retail, in terms of nightclubs, in terms of, uh, you know, what is going to be available and how, how we're going to uh, uh, stage this and, and um, uh, whether it's going to be everything at once or, or whether it's going to be um, uh, more of a, uh, well, start low and go slow, I guess was the slogan. And now that was uh, talked about on, on Beacon Hill. So uh, 78 lawmakers have uh, signed a letter urging the, uh, the control uh, commission to slow it down a little bit. Are you among those who uh, support a slowdown? I did. I just signed it yesterday. And I, um, slow down is, I don't think I'm asking for them to slow down. I want them to get the actual purchasing um, from a venue correct. And I want that to get up and running because I think that's what people have been waiting for the longest. And I think that it, it's uh, incumbent upon them to get going and get some shops open because that's what people ask for. Now, once they do that, it would seem that the next phases of, of a cafe or, or whatever else people are thinking of would make more sense. We'd have a little bit of uh, history between the medical and the recreational. I, I think they've just bitten off too much to get out in a, uh, you know, like a, a, a manner that people can understand, feel comfortable with. And by the way, um, we have to have people who will invest in this. And, I, and I've been told there are lots of people ready to invest in a shop, a place where you can go in and buy your own. I'm not sure that that exists for a cafe or, um, you know, somewhere like that, that we compare to a bar. So let's get the thing that people have said they want going, and then we can go on to the next thing. Representative Haddad, uh, the Speaker Pro Tem of the Massachusetts House, always appreciate your time. Thank you very much for spending some of this today. 
Great to speak with you, Barry. Have a Thank great you. weekend. Have a good weekend. We'll talk Thank soon. You, you too. Thank okay, you very much. Now. All right, a lot of ground cover there, a lot of interesting stuff. Well, we've got some breaking news coming in uh, right now that uh, 13 Russian nationals and three Russian entities uh, have been indicted for interfering in the U.S. Uh, election, uh, according to uh, the special counsel's office and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. Now we'll be holding a news conference within minutes to formally announce those uh, indictments. So indictments in terms of the uh, meddling with the uh, the U.S. election, all Russians uh, that we are being told anyway have been indicted in connection with this. Let me take a break. We'll come back, get your calls right after this. You're listening to 1420 WBSM.